Hello, this is Steve out in the outer darkness on Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm here to talk about justice. So, yesterday, a pastor in Portland died. He was well-loved by the, in the community. He's very popular. He was known as a good speaker. He lived comfortably with his wife and children, and he'll be missed by his congregation and family. At the back of his church was Lazarus, and he was a homeless man, often without a coat, and he would eat from dumpsters. And it used to be that the pastor would walk by Lazarus every night, and he would pray with him and ask him when he was going to stop drinking. But he never gave him food or allowed him to sleep inside the church, you see, because that would be enabling. So it happened that Lazarus also died yesterday. He was taken to Jesus, who fed him well and cared for him. The pastor, however, was taken to be punished. The pastor was allowed to see Lazarus, and he prayed to Jesus, Lord, this punishment is too severe. Couldn't Lazarus come over and give me a little help? And Jesus replied, unfortunately, it isn't allowed for Lazarus to give you any more help than you offered him in his life. Justice requires for him to be comforted now and for you to be punished for your damnable apathy. The pastor prayed again, Lord, would you please send Lazarus to my congregation? They need to know the truth. And Jesus replied, well, the one good thing you did, pastor, is to give your congregation Bibles. All they need to do is read my words without the blinders that you set on them, and they'll see the truth clearly. And that's the only visitation from a risen one that they actually need. Now, the other day, Robert talked about hell as being a poor motivator, as a, a way to stir up congregations to do what they should, but it's, that's a bad idea. And I agree, it, you know, using hell as a motivator, that's not necessarily great. But the original idea that hell is placed in the Bible is, wasn't to motivate, but to encourage. It was to tell people who are oppressed you don't have to live under the thumbs of these oppressors anymore. Now, I work with the homeless, and my homeless folks don't necessarily want to talk much about the future. Uh, not really interested in a lot of talk about resurrection, not necessarily talk, uh, interested in talking, uh, getting down to the nitty gritty of eschatology. And they don't really want to talk about the present either, because honestly, they're working too hard just to survive. But the idea of a world where they're no longer harassed by the police, where they're no longer having their stuff stolen from them by the city, that they're no longer being treated as criminals, where they're trying to survive. Now, for them, that's real hope. And if they knew that all those who acted with unjust judgment toward them, whether it be this cop or this pastor, perhaps, that all those folks would be judged, then they would know that there was some justice in the world, that God actually cared about them enough to give them justice. You see, hell isn't supposed to be some Tarantino revenge fantasy or a system of karmic justice. Rather, it is just knowing that the poor will be set free from those who oppress them for all eternity. Why does the Bible talk about resurrection? The resurrection is telling the oppressed that they can have a second chance on life without oppression. That they will never have to live under oppression anymore. That's the whole point of eschatology in the Bible. Look at Psalm 37. Uh, look at Isaiah 66. Uh, I would say it's easy for those who are comfortable, for those who don't live under that kind of oppression. They can say, oh, well, let's just focus on today. Let's just focus on ethics. Let's just talk about uh, these kinds of things and forget about eschatology. But you see, the oppressed need something beyond today. They don't want to live in today. It's too depressing to live in today. They want to hear about tomorrow's justice and peace because there's no hope of getting it today. <laughs>